Okay. First of all, just quickly, I'd like to check some background, uh, such as when did uh, the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet begin on radio? Uh, Do you know? Well, we began, Rick and I began in 1949. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were on the show for three years or two years, and the show was, um, I believe it started three years previous to that. Mm-hmm. And when did, when did it go to television then? Uh, 1952. Okay, and of course you were, you were with it then. Um, wanted to ask you uh, about your, uh, your dad. Uh, did he manage both your and Rick career, uh, your career and Rick's career? Well, he, he didn't literally manage uh, our careers. We both had uh, agents at the time, and uh, but of course he was uh, uh, instrumental in both our careers, mm-hmm. and uh, we sought his advice on everything, of course. One of the uh, um, sort of unique things about your show was uh, the women that you married actually came onto the show as your wives. Now, how did it come about that uh, these women would come on as your as your wives? Uh, it seemed to be kind of the uh, natural law of the jungle, <laughs> I guess, because of uh, the fact that we were all on the show and somehow our friends, uh, uh, even though they weren't actors, would end up on the show as fraternity brothers and, and friends in real life. And uh, uh, since Rick and I were both into athletics, a lot of our friends were athletes, which my father, as an athlete himself, found easy to uh, coach or direct because they uh, took directing uh, very well and he preferred to use uh, amateurs uh, within a certain context. Uh, you know, the big question, of course, is how close to that television show that we all saw was your real life? How close was it? Yeah, uh, in other words, uh, I even read someplace that the, that the set that you used was actually a model of your home. Uh, it was close. It was the same style as our home, but really wasn't, uh, it didn't look anything like our home. It was early American in that respect, and of course our real house and, and the set was uh, uh, both early American. But uh, as far as the storylines were concerned, a lot of the basis for the half-hour shows uh, my father took from real-life incidents, but it's real tough to be... Uh, uh, funny if you're doing a comedy show, uh, one uh, you know every a half hour show once a week to be funny every week. So a lot of the uh, uh, the jokes, of course, and the situations were came from the writers. Mm-hmm. Uh, how how close were the values and the relationships between you and your mom and dad and Rick? I think that they were real close. As mm-hmm. a matter of fact, if uh, as an and an, as an actor doing an outside motion picture or television show, I couldn't think of a better way to research part than to uh, be part of the family. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, I want to get into Rick as a kid a little bit. And, um, you know, Rick was famous uh, when, he was a, when, he, when he was younger, real young, uh, for being the I don't mess around boy kid. Right. And how close was that to him in real life at that time? Uh, that was very close. He was a, a miniature Jerry Lewis at the time. He went through several personality changes, but early on, very early on, he was extremely shy and kind of withdrawn. And then at about eight or nine, he came out of that, earlier than that, maybe seven, six, he came out of that and was very outspoken and uh, tough to deal with as an older brother. (laughs) (laughs) Now, um, uh, did he ever talk about, as a kid, a career other than show business, or did that just seem to be the direction he was gonna, always going to head in? Uh, it, it always seemed to be the direction. We never thought about any, anything else. As a matter of fact, it happened for us so early that we didn't really think much of uh, anything else. We had, all, of course, uh, dreams like uh, everybody has. Rick was... Uh, a very good tennis player, and I know he would have liked to have continued playing tennis, but I don't think he ever considered making a living that way. Mm-hmm. And he always loved music from the time that he was three and four years old. And uh, uh, I think if he had any inclination, if it was a toss-up between acting and singing, he would have chosen singing. I see. Now, how did how did he handle celebrity at that young age? You know, being being little Ricky from from uh, the television show, how, how did he handle that? What did he think about being famous? Uh, I, I think he enjoyed it very much. <laughs> he, uh, he was always a performer. 
deep down, and uh, unlike myself, I think I probably uh, felt a little embarrassment at uh, certain gatherings, but uh, Rick never seemed to. When we were, uh, as a family, went to Europe uh, the year I graduated from high school, and uh, uh, on the boat going over uh, the second night, Rick was sitting in for the drummer in the orchestra, and uh, so he had no qualms about getting up and performing. Now, your mom and dad, of course, probably encouraged your involvement in show business. Again, was it just sort of like a natural assumption that both of you would, would go into careers in the in the entertainment field? Actually, it was by accident. I don't think that they ever thought in terms of that. They were mostly concerned, and my father especially, that we do well in school, and, and uh, uh, whatever we decided to do, he would, of course, uh, be with us. He... Uh, our careers were not chosen for us by our parents and uh, when they when my mom and dad had the radio show uh, one Christmas show they had Big Crosby on the show and uh, there was a part for his son on it Lindsay and uh, Lindsay came over and uh, rehearsed for the show on the radio show and we played tennis with Lindsay occasionally and said you know, we had two child actors playing David and Ricky at the time on the radio show, and we approached our dad and said, hey, if Lindsay can be on the show, uh, why can't we? And that was the start of the whole thing? Yeah, so he tried it, and um, in those days they had a preview and then an air, and a uh, preview was Friday night, and it aired on Sunday. And, of course, you, did the, you performed just like a stage play in those days because it was live. And uh, the... Uh, preview went so well that he decided to allow us to do the Sunday show. That's great. That's how it all started. Um, you know, Rick Rick uh, moved into uh, doing his own feature film. Uh, I guess he was about 12, 13 when he worked with Ethel Barrymore, no less. Right. Um, and uh, then later on went to work with John Wayne, Dean Martin, Walter Brennan, Jack Lemmon, uh, those kind of people. Did he ever express what it was, what he felt about working with some of the, the greatest names in motion pictures? Uh, I think he enjoyed every minute of it. I never heard anything. Uh, he especially liked Jack Lemmon because Jack Lemmon was involved in music. And I know we were in Hawaii at the same time they were making Wacky a Ship. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I was performing in a circus during the summer and Rick was making the picture. And he brought Jack and the whole crew over to the circus one night, and went up and performed in the act. And I know Jack got a big kick out of that. But they were always... Uh, there were a couple of scenes in the picture where they're in a uh, kind of a nightclub setting and Jack is playing the piano and, and Rick sings with him, and I know he really liked that. Did, did Jack actually play, play the piano on that? Yes, he did. Oh, I, I had contacted Jack Lemon. I've, he is, along with Rick, he was he is like one of the big influences in, in my uh, career and my life. And um, I had contacted Jack, and unfortunately, he had to leave town to do a to do a new film and wasn't able to do an interview. But uh, uh, that's unfortunate. Who were Rick's favorite actors? Did he ever express any favorites? Uh, you know, I've I've never been asked that question before, so I don't have a stock answer. <laughs> That's all right. But uh, uh, I know he liked James Dean, and uh, we both did at the time. I'm trying to think of uh, other actors. He uh, he liked Lawrence Olivier. Uh, I can't think that uh, when he was real young, he, he uh, his idol was uh, Roy Rogers. Oh, really? So He's in those days in Hollywood, we had a theater called The Hitching Post that was down on Hollywood Boulevard in Vine. And uh, the kids would uh, take the streetcar down there as if it were a stagecoach, and they'd be all dressed in uh, cowboy outfits. And, of course, we were among them. Hmm. And uh, you had to check your cap gun at the, uh, at the desk, but everybody <laughs> carried two, so that when the villain was making his getaway, all these cap guns would come out and shoot the villain. <laughs> Um, in those days, did did you and Rick? Uh, I mean, I know this is Hollywood, and there were probably a lot of stars' children, but you you guys actually were stars. Did you and Rick r just freely associate uh, uh, with other people and go out and have the normal teenage type of experience? We really did. As a matter of fact, my father, being the producer and director of the show, made sure that we had we went to we did go to private schools, we went to public school, and then. Uh, 
during the years, of course, when Rick started to sing, he, he could no longer go to uh, public school. But that was about the time that he was getting out of high school and, and thinking about going to college. And uh, so that was the only time that we didn't go to public school. As a matter of fact, my junior high school was uh, about 400 yards from the sound stage where we did the Ozzy and Harriet show was kitty corn across the street in Hollywood so I would just walk over after school and uh, my father would set up the scene so that uh, they you know we shot them after school mm -hmm. so it was really like an after school job for us the, uh, the the legend one of the rock and roll legends is that Rick Nelson went into the recording field to impress a girlfriend uh, can you relate that story very quickly well, I'll try. He, he does a much better job of it. As a matter of fact, there was a show that he did, uh, uh, I think it was down in Louisiana, where they asked him that question, and he oh, I know that one. rather thoroughly on it. But if uh, I know he was going with somebody who was enamored uh, with Elvis Presley, and he said something uh, close to, I can do that too. And uh, she made a bet with him, and he, he went ahead and uh, recorded a scratch record on sunset boulevard and uh my father happened to hear it thought it was pretty good and took him into a studio and did a real one and then uh, lou chud of imperial records heard the recording and uh, he liked it wanted to sign rick to a, a contract which he did and uh my father put the song on the show as a matter of fact he built a storyline around the song which was i'm walking which had already been a hit with fats domino and then when it came out, Rick sold another million on it. Um, that was the start. What do you think would have happened to Rick's singing career had that song not been on the show? I mean, is there any feeling in your in your mind about would he have been a hit uh, if he hadn't if he hadn't done that? I I don't know. It's a question that you might ask other singers if they didn't have a publicity agent, <laughs> would they be a hit? Of course, it was the best source of publicity and the, the most most immediate uh, at vis-a-vis -vis, uh, music videos nowadays it was a music video from the very beginning yep. i don't know what year that was as a matter of fact uh, 1956 uh, i think rick was about uh, 17 yeah it was in 1956 um now what was what was rick's uh, i mean very very few obviously artists cut a record and sell a million copies in a week he went from being just little ricky to all of a sudden being this incredible singing star what was his reaction how did he handle this whole big new success uh i think he was uh, a little in awe of it first because uh, none of us realized or stopped to think when we were doing the television show that there were actually millions of people watching it uh, we just kind of went in and and did it and i think the uh, it for all of us it said, gee, there are a whole bunch of people out there watching the television show. And I think Rick felt the same way. He felt greater impact, I think, when he started to go out on the road and tour. Like, uh, he played the Steel Pier in New Jersey, and <clears throat> they couldn't get him out onto the pier anyway, but by helicopter. And they would take him out, because uh, there were so many people, he could literally could not get out to the end of the pier to play. Wow. And, um, uh, they would drop them off by helicopter, which uh, he found a little hairy at the time. <laughs> they, uh, and they did that with the whole band each night, and he broke all records at the Steel Pier. And I think that he was really himself in awe of that. He, it was the first time that he had to deal with the screaming girls and see them in person. And uh, uh, Do you ever comment on that? I know he enjoyed it. <laughs> he, he mentions a story where he had done... Uh, one show, I don't know, it was one of the state fairs or something, and there was an enormous audience, and uh, he was getting a little used to hotels and uh, uh, people changing his linen and putting new towels in the bathroom uh, every night, and he came home, and all of a sudden he's home and has to pick up his own towels and got the message from my mother, and uh, vis-a-vis a call downstairs, Ricky, pick up your towel, <laughs> and uh, he says, he said he thought to himself, uh, Ricky, wait a minute, I'm Mr. Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to, to uh, ask you about the, uh, the, first of all, just a, a reaction of yours. What was it like for you at that time to suddenly find yourself 
uh, becoming Rick Nelson's older brother? Well, I was always Rick Nelson's older brother. <laughs> but in, in terms of the public perception. I anything that he did wrong. It was I should have known better. And I think that's standard uh, fodder for most older brothers when they have it. Rick was four years younger than I was, and mm -hmm. I probably should have known better most of the time. <laughs> but uh, I, I had nothing uh, but uh, a wonderful feeling when all that started for Rick. It was uh, I was very proud. It was almost like... Uh, you know, this is my little brother. Yeah. Um, did your dad really negotiate a 20-year contract with DECA Records? I don't know about DECA, to be honest with you. Okay. Uh, I certainly know he negotiated a 10-year, uh, first 10-year uh, deal with the television network, and that was ABC when we first started on the show. And uh, that was a... They had to literally... They contracted us for... 10 years and then picked us up for five more after that. Uh, I believe he did negotiate the uh, Decca record contract, but I can't tell you the details. Okay. Uh, what was, uh, I want, we're kind of jumping ahead now uh, to the years about 1964-65. What was Rick's reaction to when the British invasion start, uh, started and all of a sudden his records really got knocked off the charts and and he found himself among a lot of people who were suddenly forgotten because they didn't have a British accent. How did he feel about that? Well, I think it was more the fact that it was a group than it was the fact that they were English. And up until that time, Rick had, and still continued to be throughout his life, was uh, a, tr a big fan of rock and roll music no matter who did it. And uh, I think that one of the reasons for his popularity was the fact that he was a fan himself and played the music he liked to listen to. And because of he was in the same age group as the record-buying public, that uh, he had a lot of success. And when the Beatles started up, uh, it was all of a sudden it was a group. And they had such tremendous success. It was like uh, Elvis Presley when he first started mm -hmm. that... Uh, and I'm sure Elvis felt the same way. How do you do that? In other words, you like the music too, but how do you become four people? And yeah. you know you can't. Uh, and that's the popular music right now. So I think that you have to go back and, and listen to other people who are still doing uh, single stand-up and say, gee, I like this fellow or I like that fellow. And in Rick's case, it was uh, Bob Dylan, I think. I think he started paying more attention to lyrics and what the music was saying. And um, I know I was on tour with him in uh, the late 60s, and uh, he ended up doing that tour anyway, a lot of Dylan music. Yeah, it showed up a lot in his recordings. Did Rick ever really talk to you, Dave, about where he wanted to go, what his goals in the music business were, or did he just want to keep playing? I mean, what what did he, he feel really about that? He just wanted to keep playing. He enjoyed performing. He enjoyed the audiences. Uh, he liked the fact that... Uh, I think he liked the fact that he was in a hotel someplace and somebody picked up his towels, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what sense did you have about where Rick's career was headed in, uh, say, 84, 85 and such? Well, I had hoped that he'd concentrate a little bit more on television, which he did. He made two or three pilots. Uh, I know one for NBC. I don't know what the other networks were, but uh, unfortunately, none of, none of them were picked up. But uh, I would have liked to have seen him incorporate his music uh, in television because I think that one of the reasons that he had such a great success was the uh, television audience knew, knew him. And, of course... In 1985 and 1984, uh, they knew Rick, but they knew him uh, via reruns, and it wasn't quite the same. Mm -hmm. uh, his audience was a real mixed audience. There were uh, those girls who were now uh, either mothers or even grandmothers who remembered Rick and were fans from the earlier days, and then there was a whole new group of people who liked his music just for his music and didn't re really realize he was part of the Nelson family or any of the television history. Uh-huh. Um, on the TV tribute that I saw, uh, that uh, you were talking about that interview with uh, down in Louisiana, Rick talked about the effect of touring and, and the effect that it had on his family life, and he appeared that he felt just a, just a touch guilty about being gone so much. How accurate is that picture? What did he feel about uh, about touring in relation to his family life? 
I think he did. He was going through a particularly difficult time and uh, some marital difficulty, which unfortunately ended up in a divorce. But mm -hmm. I think that that was part and parcel of the whole situation. And uh, uh, he, he was he was a very honest person. And uh, I don't think anybody in a marriage should expect somebody else to change who he is or what he does. And this goes for females as well as males, just because of the fact that you're married. If you marry somebody because you're in love with him, you're in love with the whole persona. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Rick expected anybody who was with him to be behind him, and that's what he did. And uh, he might have been apologizing for not being somebody else, but he wasn't apologizing for not being himself because he was. Yeah. Um, he, he seemed to, uh, at least from what I could glean from all the information that I've had, he seemed to hold off the road a little more during the years that, that he was going through the, the separation and the, the divorce and such. Did, did he, was he affected more? Somebody told me that they had met him throughout the years, and during that, that period, he got kind of quieter. Well, if you've ever been through a divorce, you have a tendency to get quieter. Yeah, I know exactly <laughs> what you're saying because I've been through it. <laughs> I, 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 I did myself, as a matter of fact. But uh, I think that a lot of that was forced by a lot of court appearances. And, and unfortunately, in Rick's case, the uh, thing dragged out for about two and a half years. So mm -hmm. it was a tough one. What was, uh, Rick, what was Rick's relationships with his kids like? Uh, I think they're very good. And he, he, as a matter of fact, uh, I could tell you a little story that I probably never told anybody. Please. Else. I was on a, uh, I'm a producer director with Casablanca Productions here, and we do commercials. And I was uh, looking for a location out in uh, Thousand Oaks, which is about 40 miles from uh, Hollywood. And uh, <clears throat> I, I really felt I was out in the wilderness. We needed a shot for a guy and a girl that was background of a lake scene and, uh, kind of backlit water bouncing flashing sunlight and I had the feeling I was really out there and all of a sudden I look up and here's my brother rowing a boat around the corner with both twins with fishing poles sitting in it but uh, I don't think people thought of Rick as taking the kids fishing uh, it was somehow the farthest from your impression of Rick and his relationship with his kids uh -huh. but uh, he spent a lot of time at the beach uh, with them every summer and uh, when he was home, it was good time. It was quality time. And he, he, they went skiing together quite often and took vacations a lot. Mm -hmm. So it was a good relationship. How did he regard his fans? Uh, I, think, I think he was uh, particularly impressed when he saw people that seemed to come uh, no matter where he was. There were maybe a handful, maybe 25 or 30 familiar faces that somehow, no matter where he was playing, or if it was Australia, seemed to show up in the audience. Mm -hmm. And I know he was very appreciative of that. That'll be good to know. I've, I've got a woman on the show who had seen him five times in one weekend in three different locations, and she did an interview with us. Um, what were Rick's personal hopes for the future? Uh, you know, I, I don't really know. He... he uh, he seemed a lot happier. Uh, the, uh, I guess it was Thanksgiving. Was the, actually it was uh, Christmas when I when I saw him. He seemed a lot happier this last Christmas in '85 than I'd seen him in a long time, and it was almost like there was a, a lifting of weight off his shoulders that uh, had been with him for about four or five years, and. Uh, I think that uh, things were starting to straighten out in his personal life, and uh, uh, he was hopefully uh, writing more songs, had just recorded uh, an album, uh, which was a re-record of a lot of older records that he had done, and he was hopeful that that would do well. Plus, he had uh, television offers here in town, so he was uh, very hopeful that uh, his career was going to go up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great album, by the way. I just happened to, to get it last week uh, and uh, listen to it. It's a great album. What, uh, Just incidentally, what is your favorite Rick Nelson song? Um, Do you have one? I think that probably Hello, Mary Lou is my personal favorite. Yeah. Uh, of, of Rick's 
songs. And there are other songs that I like very much that he sang that were other people's songs. Mm-hmm. But uh, um, I got one final question because I know you're pressed for time. How would you like the world to remember your brother? Uh, I, I think he would like uh, people to remember him as a singer who loved to perform and loved to please audiences and that was his role in life and he got more reward out of an audience thoroughly enjoying his performance than anything and I would like to think of him as a, as a singer and as a, probably one of the uh, best human beings that I've ever met that's great I can't express to you in in simple words what it meant first of all to talk to you as David Nelson but for you to to spend time talking about your brother and I want you to know that through my talking to all sorts of different people the fans and the fellow performers and such that uh, we all share very very seriously and very heartfelt we all share a very great love and a very great respect for uh, your brother in a very great sense of loss Thank for you, him. John. I, I appreciate that very much. And, of course, it was uh, very difficult on all of us, as a, you know, and I include you in, in that group. And any time that you, you've got the phone number, any time you want to give me a call, please be, feel free to do so. And if I can uh, be of any more help in any way as far as uh, records or something that you're missing or some information, thank you very much. David, thank you. I'm going to let you go now, but thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Nice to talk to you. Bye.